Well, it's a great privilege to introduce our guest today, Dr. David Wang. <laughs> He's a psychology professor on campus. He's also a pastor in Fullerton, okay? You know, uh, I've known Dave for about 10 years now. We went to seminary together at Talbot, and it's been a good friendship, and I'm grateful to have your friendship, so thank you for being here. Likewise. Let's welcome Dave. Thank you. Great to be here. So Dave, you know, we're heading into midterms, and I think that um, a lot of us are hitting the wall. Okay, it's about five weeks in the semester. You know, I'm getting short with people. I have less compassion for people. I'm developing this cough, and I just feel like, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to get out of this haze, right? I mean, yeah. you have any insights into something like that? You know, I, I felt like I hit the wall too, maybe about two weeks ago. The semester started great, because I think we had like a Monday off, and you know, it was like a partial week, so I thought I was kind of easing into the semester well, but then just about two, three weeks ago, I just felt like I, uh, slammed, and I, I feel like I'm just struggling to catch up ever since. So I, I definitely relate with, uh, with that idea. And I, I remember um, uh, in my classes earlier this week, I can just tell that all the students are so tired. They're all so stressed and really tr hard, trying so hard to stay awake. And I know a lot of students are sick, too. A anyone sick here or kind of? You know, yeah, I can, I can see all you guys. Um, and, uh, you know, that totally makes sense because... Um, when we're stressed and we're uh, kind of lacking sleep, uh, our immune system just doesn't function in peak capacity. I, have you guys noticed that people tend to get sick right around finals time or right around midterm time? It's not a coincidence. Okay. Well, you know, uh, another thing I, I hear ar around school these days is like, that people are really anxious, especially with midterms coming up, like you, yeah. you mentioned, and with midterms just passing possibly. Um, and I know that's something that you've been thinking about, and that's something that is part of your expertise, is anxiety yeah. and emotional regulation. Do you want, uh, were you always an expert in that? Was, how did you come to develop some of your ideas and how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with stress? Yeah, you know, I, for most of my life, I was, I've been horrible at managing my stress, like absolutely horrible. And as I kind of think back, um, there's at least a few reasons for this. I think part of it is the fact that I'm a guy, you know, and, <laughs> um, and, and I feel like I, I kind of grew up uh, with these expectations placed on me that, you know, to be a guy means that I just kind of suck my emotions up, right? I remember one time when I was a kid and I like totally wiped out when I was um, riding a bike and I just sucked it all in. It hurt like heck. I really wanted to cry, but I just sucked it in. And I remember this really elderly couple kind of see me just going... <laughs> And they're like, good job, good job. You know, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know, so I just kind of have this image of, you know, that's what a, what, a, what a guy, you know, being a guy means. And then also I think it has uh, something to do with um, kind of my Christian religious upbringing because I kind of grew mm. up in a church where um, I was taught that I shouldn't trust my emotions, you know, that emotions could lead us astray, that my faith was supposed to be grounded in facts and on the historicity of the gospel, yeah. and that if it was grounded on feelings, it would be just really, you know, it, it, would, it would be kind of fickle. So I almost kind of taught, I was taught at church almost this idea that, you know, my feelings aren't supposed to be trusted. So if you kind of put these two together, this idea of like what it means to be a Christian man, uh, then we kind of get this image of this just really, you know, stoic, this really like strong individual that doesn't let emotions phase them. Right. And when you're kind of uh, hitting this wall and you're encountering resistance, really the answer is to just kind of put your head down and just power it through, kind of, you know, to suck, suck up your emotions in the name of Jesus almost. Right, 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 right. I mean, so there's a gender piece, being a man, right? But there's also a religious piece, being a Christian. Yeah. You know, even for me, if I think about it, there's like a, a, a cultural piece, right? Yes. An ethnicity piece, just being Asian, and I, we relate in that way. Yep, yep. And you know, it's like, if I think about my dad, he was never very emotive, you know? They, my dad and my mom really only really cared about the, the grades I got or the awards that I achieved and things like that. Was there a time in your life where you felt like, you know what, I need to manage my emotions a little bit better. Was there a time where you intentionally thought, okay, how do I deal with my emotions? Yeah, I think the time in my life when I learned that I needed to take seriously this kind of problem of me um, not knowing how to manage my emotions, it started in seminary, actually, when I yeah. was in my mid-20s. And um, I'm not sure if everyone, many people know this, but when I was in seminary, I used to struggle with panic attacks. Are you guys familiar with panic attacks? It's like a horrible experience where you start feeling like, almost like you're having a heart attack, your, your chest and your heart's kind of palpitating, you're, sometimes you start, you know, see, your vision's kind of spinning, you, you kind of have like sweaty palms. It's, it's, it's a really horrible experience. And, right. 
Um, when I look back, I just kind of uh, reflect on just all the stressors in my life. And I think you guys can relate to this, that being a student is just really, really stressful, right? Like, right. for yeah. one, like, you, you don't have enough money, right? So that's always <laughs> yeah, kind of sure. like a point in stress. There's, yeah. you, you don't have much control over your life because these horrible professors are, <laughs> you know, assigning all these things that you have to do, you know? And, and in my case, I, I didn't grow up in Southern California, so I had to move down here. It's stressful to move down here. You have to make new friends. You have to get used to things, uh, like the new environment. In my case, I, I think I, was, I just got recently married. That's a big stressful transition as well. Yeah. And um, I, I used to be, a, I was a pastor for a little while before then, and I was just coming off a really horrible, uh, a really difficult uh, ministry relationship. So by the time I got here to seminary, I was just in really bad shape. And yeah. I, I think for about a year or two, I just had these really overwhelming emotions coming out, but I just did what I thought I was supposed to do. I just kind of sucked it all in and just tried to power through. And, and it actually worked for about a, it worked for about a year, a year and a half. Right. And at some point, my physical body just, it took such a toll on my physical body, and my body just shut down. It said, Dave, I just, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I began to just have perpetual panic attacks. And at that time, mm. I remember um, just being in this crisis of faith, because I was thinking to myself, well, you know, God, why don't you deliver this, me from this kind of uh, thing? And yeah. I would remember I would just pray night after night and night after night. I even uh, presented myself to these inner healing uh, kind of prayer rooms to ask for other people to pray for me. Mm. Uh, for a time, I thought it was kind of a spiritual warfare problem. And then for a time, I thought it was kind of a, kind of a sin problem. So I was kind of, you know, just searching my own heart for, you know, hidden sin and just confessing and repenting from sin. And I was just doing everything I could to kind of try to figure out what was going on. Hmm. But no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I prayed, it just didn't, it just didn't go away. And it, right. was, it was very confusing. I think it was really especially confusing in my prayer life. And um, until I, I reached a point where in my, out of desperation, I remember just going online and picking up this workbook, this mental health workbook on uh, panic disorder. And I began reading through it, and I learned about what panic disorder is. I learned about uh, anxiety. And I learned about all these techniques and things that I can do to actually manage my emotions and to cope and to calm myself down. And for about you know, three or four months, I would just practice those every single day. Yeah. And you know, ever since, I have not struggled with panic for the last eight years, wow. eight to nine years. Yeah. Well, so it seems like what you're saying is, uh, anxiety, stress, these kind of things, there's a mental part of that. There could be a spiritual part right. to that. There absolutely right? could be. But that, for you, at that time, it was actually learning the mental tools right. to, to deal with that. I think at that time, I, I thought that what I really needed was a supernatural intervention. Right. When, in fact, I needed just a natural intervention. And, and I think it's the cool thing about the God that we believe in is because God created the world and God created the human body, That's right. both the supernatural as well as the natural, they both come from him. Yeah. So I, I can see, uh, so when I look back and I, and I think about that, uh, uh, that mental health kind of panic workbook, yeah. I see that as a, as a gift from God. I see that as uh, God's answer to prayer. And I f in fact, I think God used that to inspire me to go into mental health, to go study to become a psychologist after uh, I finished up seminary. And I think that, was, that played a big part to who I am uh, right now and what I'm doing right now. So I'm very thankful for it. Okay. So, you know, we talked about the church a little bit and how yeah. sometimes we, we get played into some of these spiritual, like, patterns that might not be healthy in some sense yeah. for mental health. And we talked about family relations a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, where are we supposed to learn how to deal with our emotions well? How, where are we supposed to learn uh, mental health? Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a super important question to ask. I think when I reflect on my own life, I think um, my answer was that I, I didn't have anywhere to learn this kind of stuff. Yeah, me neither. You know? Yeah. Um, in my case, I, I was really lucky because I... Uh, learned a lot of these things in graduate school when I was studying to become a psychologist, yeah. but not everyone's called to be a psychologist. And, right. um, and uh, I think for me, as, as not only a psychologist, but um, as a pastor, mm -hmm. I feel like this is uh, really kind of pointing to how I believe it's really, it would be really important for churches to more intentionally and more thoughtfully teach on emotions and feelings. I think it would be so important for churches to kind of ask the question, like, what, what can we learn about emotions by examining 
all the emotions that God modeled for us throughout Scripture by considering, like, under what circumstances and for what reason did God feel these emotions? Like, what, what can we learn from observing and reflecting on Christ himself feeling despair and loneliness at times, of, of Jesus Christ himself feeling joy and happiness, or Jesus Christ himself feeling angry, right? I think there's quite a lot to learn. And, and I don't think that it's... Um, I think it's fair to say that most of our congregations, and this is certainly true in the congregation that I pastor, most of us didn't grow up in families where we had parents that modeled this stuff to us, yeah. right? Yeah. We, we didn't grow up in families that had parents that actually took the time to teach us how to cope with our emotions. Yeah. I think on one hand, we had uh, parents that you know, were so scared of showing their negative emotions to their kids, they would kind of, you know, at all costs, try to, you know, hide them from their kids. So if, you know, the father and mother would argue, a lot of times they would just try to do it with the kids, you know, away so that they never see it. But, you know, there's a problem with that. The problem is that children never actually get to see what a, a healthy argument looks like. Yeah. Children don't get an opportunity to see what it looks like to actually work through disagreements, work through communication, miscommunication, and actually repair a relationship. Wow. We don't get an opportunity to see that. And on the other hand, there's also the kinds of parents who kind of let their emotional dysregulation be on full display, you know, for all <laughs> to see. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times children in these kinds of families kind of grow up bearing the burden of not just carrying the weight of their own emotions, but also carrying the weight of their parents' emotions. Wow. Right? I see a lot of head nodding. I think some That's of heavy. you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and as a result, a lot of us grow up um, be perfectionistic. A lot of us grow up as people pleasers because wow. that's what we needed to be to keep emotional harmony in our families. Yeah. Right? Perfectionism, people pleaser, emotional harmony in the family. That is the story of my life. Thanks for <laughs> unpacking me right now. Okay. All right. So Dave, we're just going to jump into some questions from good. our students and our Biola community mm -hmm. here. Okay. Here we go. Uh, would you be willing to share some basic steps of the natural interventions uh, you use to help get over stress, and have better mental health? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there are a lot of practical things that we can do, but before we jump into the practical things, I kind of want to touch on maybe two obstacles that, we, that a lot of us uh, run into before we can even try those things. And the first one is that perhaps the most important step towards um, managing or caring for your emotions is to just name them. And maybe to take that a step further, not only to name your emotions, but to accept the fact that you're feeling them. You know, mm -hmm. I think that was, that was my big problem because, you know, I, I was a pastor, I was a seminary student, right. and I, I had this belief that because I was those things, I wasn't allowed to have certain emotions. Right, wow. Right. Like this idea that I wasn't allowed to hurt, right. I wasn't allowed to be angry because I mean, good Christians aren't supposed to be angry, and pastors definitely shouldn't be angry, you know? No. But yet, I was angry, right? right? And, and I think that points to, the, for me, the most fundamental principle of caring for your emotions. And it's that you can't care for your emotions until you accept that you're actually feeling them. And I find that in my uh, pastoral work, in my therapy work with Christians in particular, the hardest step is just to get to a per get, uh, help a person get to the place where they're willing to accept that they're feeling these emotions that they might be ashamed of feeling, yeah. or they, they're feeling these emotions that they just feel like it's unacceptable for me to feel them. Okay. But they are. Right. So that was one obstacle, just right. naming them, right? What was, what, what's the second one you said? Um, and I think after you name your emotions, I would ask you, uh, I would ask you, uh, I encourage you to ask yourself the question, is there something important that your feelings are trying to tell you. Okay. Because usually, I would actually say almost always, there's a reason for your emotions. And there's usually a really good reason for your emotions. Yeah. And one of the functions that our emotions kind of play is that they communicate things to ourselves and they also communicate things to other people. So for example, feelings communicate stuff like, um, you know what, that really hurt. Don't do that again. Feelings also communicate stuff like, you know, that, that might not have been really important to you, but that was really, really important to me. And, and these kinds of things that our feelings communicate, they're actually really important to hear, right? And, and let me be clear that, you know, for us to be 
really careful about hearing, uh, thoughtful about hearing our emotions. I'm not trying to say that we need to let our emotions kind of dictate our lives or that, you know, we should just follow the whims of our emotions. In fact, what I'm saying is that, you know, there are going to be times in your life where you have to speak into those emotions. You might have to change them a little. But if you listen to them well, I would actually argue that you can speak into them in a more effective way. Cool. Cool. Great. Thanks for sharing some of those things. Okay. It's just like... Being honest with ourselves, letting us feel those things, but actually exploring, hey, what are, what are some of our deep beliefs in that too? Right. Okay, cool. Let's go to the next question, is that okay? Okay. So is there a place at Biola that I can go to for stress and anxiety and talk to someone about coping? I actually wanted to share something because at the end of the yeah. chapel, you so you guys longer? usurp my, my, my little closing statement, guys, okay? <laughs> but, um, you know, we have, a, we have a pastoral care and student, student services. I'm, I'm part of the pastoral care team. Um, our campus pastors here, we're, we're all part of the pastoral care team. We've got spiritual direction over there at the Grove with the Institute for Spiritual Formation. We also have the Biola Counseling Center, okay, and I know Dave um, oversees some of the interns at the Biola Counseling Center. And then I would also say at the Biola Counseling Center, there's actually a stress management course called RIO that mm-hmm. is just launching. So if that is something that's interesting to you, please go find help in that way too. Yeah. So stress management course called Rio. Also, oh, there's a slide here. Oh, they made a slide. All this stuff is places that you can look for. Great. And, and I definitely want to give a special shout out to the Biola Counseling Center. Uh, please. Uh, I think they do a lot of great work. But also, I mean, uh, let me just say that you don't actually, uh, I would want to encourage you guys to um, reach out for help just among your friends. You don't necessarily have to go to the counseling center. Yeah. I feel like, for me, as a pastor as well as a psychologist, there's sometimes I, I feel like I can do so much more to help people as a pastor rather than as a professional psychologist. So let me just encourage you guys to not suffer alone, to reach out to friends, to reach out to, uh, maybe not all your friends, but your safe friends. That, mm, you, know, you, you know what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Um, the ones that won't just kind of give you advice, but you know, the ones that will actually listen to you and yeah, hear you good. out before they speak into your heart. Um, reach out to your pastors, reach out to your spiritual directors. Um, yeah. uh, all those sources of support are so important. Great, yeah. thanks. All right, I feel like I've been taught well to think biblically. That's good. How do I get to a place of feeling biblically? Oh, wow. Deep question. Oh, wow, that's a big question. We got deep students here, Dave. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, um, I think the, and and this kind of goes to one of my favorite uh, Bible verses. It's uh, Psalm 139, uh, verse 23 to 24, and it says says this. I actually have it in my notes. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Mm. And, I, and I think uh, sometimes when I, when I think of uh, God speaking into my life, I, I think of God kind of changing my beliefs or changing my convictions. And that's yeah. certainly part of the sanctification process. Right. But I think you know, alongside that process, something that's just as important is inviting God to change my feelings, to change my emotions, to change my... Um, I think what uh, Jonathan Edwards, he's a Puritan theologian, would describe as uh, changing my religious affections, mm, changing yeah. my affectional dispositions to, be, to, to mirror those of God. So this idea of um, sanctification and spiritual maturity as not just doing uh, what God wants me to do, but having a heart that's, that loves doing what God wants me to do. So that yeah. as I'm obeying God and following God's ways, I'm just doing what I love. Yeah. And that's a much greater challenge than just kind of behavioral change because I need a heart that's renewed to actually love these things that I'm not naturally predisposed to love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's good. Sometimes we think it's like think, then do. Right. Right? But it feels like there's a thinking aspect, there's a feeling aspect, and together that helps us do exactly. a little bit more intrinsically and a little more holistically. Exactly. And, and you know, um, God can't do that emotional work until we have the courage to face the reality of what we're actually feeling. Yeah. Like if, if we're stuck in la-la land and in denial land and pretending that we're not feeling things that we're actually feeling, we're actually not allowing God to search our hearts. 
Mm. He's, we're not allowing God to test us to, to know our anxious thoughts. That's right. And, and we don't provide God with a platform or an invitation to actually speak into it. So I think maybe the, the, the first step into this work is perhaps the, uh, the, for us to have the courage to be brutally honest with the feelings that we actually have. Yeah. No, even in that passage, I think the way, I love the way it's worded because it's not take away my anxious thoughts, right. but it's know my anxious thoughts. Right. It's not take away these bad things in my heart, but it's search my heart. Right, so. and I, I've prayed those prayers so many times. Like, yeah. God, just take this away. Yeah. And sometimes they're answered, but most of the time I feel like they're not. Yeah. And um, I, I think perhaps the better way is, Lord, show me how to navigate this. That's good. And if, if I learn how to navigate it through natural means and supernatural means, I have just have so many more tools to bless the world and to help other people. That's good. Right. That's good. All right, let's go for another question. There's two questions that are related, it looks like. I'm just going to ask the second one, okay? Okay. So here we go. How can I sympathize, empathize with a friend who is going through anxiety and depression? So okay. what does empathy look like? How can I sympathize? Okay. I think the first step and the most important step is to listen well, to just not say much and kind of zip it. You know, just let, let them talk and hear, hear them out. And one of the principles that I teach the Rosemead students is this principle of um, finding the, the nugget of truth, right? Because uh, no matter what a person's thinking or feeling, even if they're, they're thinking of things that you know are not healthy, if you search deep enough, there's something that you can still validate. There's still some, there's something good that you can get behind. So take, for example, um, I know a lot of people, uh, more people than we realize, uh, cut themselves. They, 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 they engage in various behaviors that, that, yeah. that, that you know, self-harm behaviors. Yeah. Right? Relieving stress in some right. sense, right? Re relieving yeah. stress. And of course, like, I think we would all agree that, you know, that's not a good thing to do, right. you know? But if you listen to them well, and you listen to them uh, in terms of like, what's motivating this behavior. Oftentimes you'll hear that you know, people are cutting themselves because they want to feel again. Mm. They feel so emotionally numb. Right. This is the only way that they can actually feel something again. Yeah. Right? And, um, and you know what? Even though I don't condone the behavior, I can get behind that. I right. can say, you know what? That's something that I can affirm and validate. And I, I would even add, you know what? God would probably affirm and validate with that as well. Yeah. Let's kind of join in with you to find a way where you can actually feel, but maybe not do, uh, but not do so in a way that's so um, potentially damaging to yourself. Yeah. Right. So find that nugget of truth yeah. and then navigate a, a more proper way to figure out how to do that well. Right. Exactly. Okay. Great. All right. Here's another question. Okay. You mentioned letting children watch a healthy argument. Yeah. Could you please elaborate? Because I'm not understanding how an argument could be emotionally edifying. From what I have studied, I've only heard of such a thing having negative psychological consequences. Yes, great question. And, and certainly, when parents argue, a lot of the times it does lead to negative um, uh, consequences. I think especially when arguments kind of degenerate into kind of this, um, uh, this dynamic where the point of the argument is just to hurt each other. It's not really to kind of clarify or yeah. to, mis uh, to clarify miscommunications. And in those kind of cases where you're just trying to hurt each other, I would agree, that's not the most kind of helpful for children to watch. But on the other hand, if it's the kind of argument where it's really just based on this mis miscommunication, right. I think it actually might be healthy for children to, uh, to watch some of that. I know when uh, my, I have two daughters, uh, my oldest uh, daughter is nine, the youngest daughter is seven. And um, I make it a point that um, I want them to see, see it, not only when my wife and I argue, but I, I want to see them, I, I want them to see us make up and repair the argument. Yeah. And we almost make it a point where we kind of recap and, and say something like, you know, mommy and daddy were really mad at each other because mommy felt this way, because mommy thought daddy was doing this, and daddy was mad at mom because of this, but 
was that right, Lydia? And they would go, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Daddy thought this, but actually this. So what, what was this? And all this was a miscommunication. And then they would actually see us repair the argument. They would see us kind of make amends and give each other a hug. And a lot of times I would kind of give my wife a massage and that kind of, you know, that's like one sign that, that we're making up. And, I, and I, I'm hoping that this is a healthy thing for them to see so that they can actually have this model to them so that they can, uh, you know, when they eventually get married and they're in the kind of a thick of uh, some, some heavy argument with their spouse, yeah. they can kind of go back to these images of their mom and dad having legitimate arguments and yeah. being hurtful, but also knowing how to get out of that and knowing how to repair from that yeah. as well. I mean, what I love about that is that you're not modeling perfectionism, like right. we're perfect parents, but you're modeling like listening well, perspective taking, listening right. to the other person. And you're also modeling a sense of like reconciliation, like trying to like always work through issues to like right. get together and, and make it work together. And another, and another thing I think is important to model is modeling how to do apologies well. That's right? good. Because there are times where you just apologize for the sake of apologizing because you want to get it over with, but that's not enough. That's not a good apology. I, 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 wanna, I want them to see, like, I apologize for this. Yeah. You know, like I know exactly what I'm apologizing for. Yeah. Instead of just like, oh, I already apologized. Why are you still mad at me? I think usually yeah. when we're still mad, it means that we haven't really hit out uh, exactly what needs to be apologized for. Okay. So when we apologize, be a little more specific. Yeah. Not just, I apologize if you felt blah, 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 right? Right. But actually own some of the things that you've done. Right. And I think it's healthy for my, my daughters, especially, to see a grown man apologize and admit that at times I might be wrong as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Hey, you know, as we close, um, this is a question we ask all of our Biola Hour guests, and that is, what biblical principles have helped shape some of your thoughts today, and how has that guided even your practice as a psychologist, but what might be helpful for us? Yeah. Um, so I what think, are some of the biblical principles? I think the main one was that, that a Psalm 139 verse that I shared about earlier, the, you know, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me, know my anxious thoughts, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I think the biblical principle, as I mentioned earlier, is, you know, I, I would like to say that, um, posit that, you know, courage, like Christian courage, hmm. you know, isn't me sucking up my emotions and powering through, right? Yeah. Courage is me having the courage to face the reality of the feelings that I'm actually feeling so that I can actually bring them before God and provide a context for God to, to speak into it and to lead us in the way everlasting. So I just want to encourage you guys to do that hard work as you continue in this semester. Great. Thanks, Dave. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.